Welcome to the yeah, 19th, welcome to the nineteenth uh, webinar. Today talk will be on uh, today talk will be on uh, advanced spine surgery. On that we'll have a on that we'll have a presentation. We'll be sharing his uh, thoughts, sharing his uh, thoughts about the uh, oblique lumbar intraoblique fusion, oblique lumbar intraoblique fusion, and uh, the second talk will be on uh, the second talk will be based on uh, navigation spine surgery. Navigation spine surgery will be shared by Dr. Yuvraj. Will be shared by Dr. Yuvraj. So I will come first to Dr. Krishna. I will come first to Dr. Krishna to share about Oli. Yeah. So uh, can I start, Ram? Yeah. Yes. Good. Yeah. Yeah. yeah yes. Good. So good evening, all. Uh, I hope you are all doing well amidst the uh, COVID pandemic. Anyway, to talk about the OLIF, uh, this is uh, uh, whenever we talk about the fusion surgeries, we talk more uh, in terms of uh, inner body fusion or posterolateral fusion. And uh, we all agree to the fact that inner body fusion is much more uh, stable than the posterolateral fusion. So uh, then, then has, uh, it has about there we uh, have come into the era where we do a lot of inner body fusion rather than posterolateral fusion. So uh, by doing the inter uh, interbody fusion, we eliminate the pathological uh, segmental motion uh, at the related, uh, which is related to the symptom, and uh, during which, uh, over a period of time, it forms an osseous bridge between the mobile uh, levels between the two vertebral body. Uh, it has evolved from 1911, where Albia uh, uh, used tibial graft, and it has evolved to such an extent that the people have started uh, doing the interbody fusion with a minimal approach. And uh, uh, this fusion is more in terms of a lot of stability, where we achieve by putting a lot of bone graft and good uh, surface contact between the two vertebral body. So uh, by doing OLIF, uh, which is better than and TLIF and PLIF in terms of good purchase between the two uh, in plates where we achieve a lot of a solid bony fusion. Uh, we, where all we do such uh, cases uh, and the indicated cases are uh, the deformity correction like degenerative colitis and spondylolisthesis, recurrent uh, disc collapses, tumors, infections and trauma. So uh, this picture depicts approaches to the interbody fusion. Uh, the classical fusion which we all are versed with is a posterior uh, approach where we do P lift or T lift. Then came the anterior approach where the surgeons go anteriorly and do a fusion. And now people have started doing, uh, using the lateral approach which minimizes the surgical complications which includes the extreme lateral approach which is X lift or the oblique approach which is uh, uh, the OLIF and we do interbody fusion by this approach. So the main difference between the XLIF and OLIF is XLIF we do both of the lateral approaches wherein extreme lateral we go through the muscle and split the psoas muscle. In all, it split the psoas muscle and such. The advantage uh, by doing this lateral approach uh, is by uh, we don't destabilize the posterior structures, which are paraspinal muscles. So we all know that the contributing factor to stability in the posterior aspect, apart from the posterior column, are the paraspinal muscles. So by doing the surgery in posterior approach, there will be a scarring of the muscle. We won't get back the normal strength of the muscle, which was pre-operative, uh, uh, pre-operatively. So by doing this approach, we prevent the scarring of the posterior muscles and thereby increases the structural stability of the spine as such. And by doing this oblique approach, we give a lot of big interbody space and restore the interbody space by which we restore the lumbar lordosis. And we don't have to do a lot of uh, multiple level of uh, uh, T lifts to achieve the lumbar lordosis. 
previous in the previous talk they have uh, lakshmikanth has told about the lumbar lordosis as you meant which is almost near the pelvic incidence which can be achieved with lesser fusion levels by oblique approach or anterior approach and uh, the main disadvantage with oblique approach is we do we cannot uh, get an access to the l5 and s1 level so for that level we'll have to opt for the anterior approach and in oblique approach the main difference is if you go slightly the entry point is slightly anterior to the lateral approach so which is oblique between the, the iliac crest the entry point of the lateral approach is between the iliac crest and the 12th rib and the entry point for the whole lip is 5 cm anterior to the lateral approach where exactly you land up at the oval window can you get into the and uh, there are few contraindications where you do not have to do the lateral approaches are uh, the calcified iota prior vascular reconstruction surgeries and uh, prior intra abdominal surgeries where you get a lot of scarring where you don't appreciate uh, the structures well and in high grade blisters uh, where you do not achieve the reduction when you go for pole and uh, uh, in pelvic inflammatory disease when you do oblique approach and put a, a bigger graft or the bigger cage you increase the size of the disc space thereby indirectly you will decompress the foramen or the canal stenosis but however in severe lumbar canal stenosis you cannot completely achieve the decompression the advantages with olip are it, it prevents the injury to the psoas muscle and lumbar plexus which you usually encounter in lateral approaches where you split open the psoas muscle because the lumbar plexus are inside the psoas muscle as such and you will be away from the peritoneum and the vasculature and it prevents the retrograde ejaculation by preventing the injury to sympathetic uh, plexus and we have a direct visualization to the face and the lesser incidences of hernia and ilias as we are not interfering with the abdominal structures and there is minimal blood loss during this procedure as there is no muscle ripping or is just a blunt dissection till the disc space coming to the surgical technique of intrabody fusion the very important point is the patient positioning have to be real not injuring the peritoneum and the trans psoas and the disc exposure in lateral approach you go through the psoas whereas in olip you retract the psoas and get to get you get to the disc level of interest then you start doing the discectomy and the implant preparation then to the appropriate size cage so uh, to see uh, the position of the patient when you do a lateral approach uh, you need enough space between the 12th rib and the iliac crest therefore the patient has to be positioned on the right side in any any approach either the lip or whole lip the patient has to be positioned on right lateral position left side upwards so when you do the lateral approach you need enough space to get into the disc space therefore you need a table break to increase the space between the 12th rib and the iliac crest and while positioning the patient all bromine prominences have to be padded the hip has to be in flexion so as to relax the psoas muscle and get a easy retraction so by doing this you get a good get enough space for doing the procedure but the advantage with olive is you don't have to break the table and the position is same the uh, the patient leg need not be extended uh, patient leg need not be flexed and the patient uh, once it positioned the proper way uh, the strapping has to be done so that the position should not uh, the position has to be maintained and uh, the advantage with olif is the surgeon will be standing anterior to the patient if you see the olif the pa uh, the surgeon will be standing posterior to the patient where the uh, the surgeon has to bend and look into the disc space uh in this case the surgeon will be standing anterior to the uh, patient 
and we'll be visualizing the displays directly. Since it is a long procedure, the, uh, the surgeon will not get tired doing this procedure. Right? And uh, this is the difference in positioning of LF and OLF. To see if the X-rays are symmetrical in AP and parallel in lateral view. Symmetrical in the sense, the pedicle has to be symmetrical in lateral view. The level of interest, uh, the display has to change the position of the CM. So, uh, if you're doing single level in the lateral view and in AP view, the pedicle has to be symmetrical on both the sides. And here are the surface markings where you do with the K wire, which is kept parallel to the 12th rib and the iliac crest. Take a CM shoot in the lateral uh, view and the K wire has to be exactly at the center of the disc space, which is parallel to the end plates. And in the AP view, uh, as I said before, it has to be symmetrical. So when you are taking the uh, lateral view, the uh, you keep the guide wires exactly positioning at the center of the disk space, which is shown in the image. So once the position is confirmed, the position uh, is fixed in the uh, no, can you repeat that once again? Because no, can you repeat that once again? Because there was a okay. So I'll repeat the surface markings. You mark the twelfth rib and the iliac crest first, and take a X-ray in the lateral view, as if you are doing the L rib. So the e, uh, the guide wires has to be placed exactly at the center of the disc space. You can see in the fluoroscopy image. So the guide wires are exactly at the center of the level of interest where you are operating. So once the level is confirmed, you have to mark the level as if you are doing the LA. So once the level is marked, you can see the scale. The tip of the scale shows the exact marking which you have taken on the C arm at the lateral view. So when you are doing the O lip, the entry point has to be 5 centimeters anterior to the point which has marked earlier by taking the CM guidance. Is it clear or should I repeat it from? Huh? Yeah. Huh? Is the point taken or should I repeat it? No, it's the good. Go ahead. Okay. No, it's the good. Go so uh, once you get the exact entry point for the whole lift, uh, the incision it's up to the surgeon whether he can take vertically, horizontally, or obliquely. But I personally prefer uh, taking incision parallel to the 12th rib so as to do orthogonal maneuver, which I'll be explaining at the latest uh, slide. So uh, the exact level of incision has to be, if you're doing the single level uh, surgery, say L3-4, your entry point has to be at the disc space of L3 and 4. And Suppose you are doing surgeries at L2-3 and L3-4, your incision has to be at the level of L3 vertebral body so as to get good access to both L2-3 and L3-4 as well. So uh, you start your surgery by doing a skin incision, then do a blunt dissection underneath. Immediately after the blunt dissection, you see the fibers running parallelly which is running obliquely towards the pubic symphysis and that muscle is an external oblique muscle. So immediately below, uh, so these are the fibers which are running parallelly. Uh, this is a cadaveric uh, depiction. And immediately below the external oblique muscle, the fibers which run perpendicular to the external oblique are the internal oblique muscle. So once you dissect the internal oblique muscle, there comes a transverse abdominus which runs uh, transversely below the internal oblique muscle. So this is a video which shows the muscle fibers which are running parallelly. So uh, after the skin gland dissection, you see the external oblique muscle. Once you see the external oblique muscle, use an electro pottery to cut the external oblique muscle. And with a finger, 
you make a plane underneath and lift it up to visualize the internal oblique muscle which is perpendicular to the fibers of the external oblique muscles once uh, you get to the internal oblique muscles you cauterize it dissect it underneath with your finger and appreciate the transverse abdominal muscle at this level you have to be careful while using the electro cautery as you might impinge and uh, uh, injure the peritoneum so uh, when you see the transverse abdominal muscle gently dissect the transverse abdominal muscle put your finger or the uh, scissors underneath open it up to do a blunt dissection then try to dissect it so below the transverse abdominal muscle there is a thin transverse cellulitic fascia once you resect the fascia there will be a retroperitoneal fat so you will have to push the retroperitoneal fat after the blunt dissection anteriorly and medially so once you di- uh, retract it anteriorly you feel the muscle dorsally which is a bulk when you insinuate the finger which is a quadratus lumborum and adjacent to that you can feel the transverse process and you go deep inside the transverse process you will appreciate the uh, uh, body before the body there will be another bulk muscle ventrally which is a psoas muscle so this is uh, this is the cadaveric depiction and that is a skin which is bluntly dissected right underneath the skin that is external oblique muscle so underneath the external oblique muscle we see the internal oblique muscle under which that muscle which you are seeing is a transverse abdomen so this is a cadaver where uh, we have exposed all the muscle to appreciate and when you go deep inside this is this muscle posterior to the peritoneal fat is the psoas muscle so it is very important to appreciate the psoas muscle when you do an o lift and you have to resect till the anterior border of the psoas and when you dissect the peritoneum your retroperitoneal entry is really important and you should never never injure the peritoneum so you have to do the blunt dissection always with your finger insinuated and lifting the peritoneum medially from the posterior abdominal wall it has to be done caudal to cephaloid once the peritoneum is released from the uh, abdominal wall it has to be pushed medially so as the abdominal contents will fall forward once the peritoneum is pushed or retracted forward you can appreciate the quadratus lumborum and then go deep inside to appreciate the psoas muscle with uh, anterior to the muscle once you appreciate the psoas muscle then go anterior to the psoas muscle to reach the oval window the structures you got to be careful by doing this procedure are ureter which crosses in front of the common iliac artery which feels like a thick band and it has a peristalsis movement so usually you don't usually you don't try to see the ureter it will fall for, uh, forward when you uh, retract the peritoneum and this is the deep dissection that is the psoas muscle which is retracted posteriorly and that is a disc space this is a infected disc that's the reason it's uh, being uh, eroded and that's the disc space which you can see and uh, anteriorly there is the yellow color thing is the fat peritoneal fat so you should always know the anatomy of the psoas it starts from t12 Uh, and uh, the in- origin point is from T12 to L5, and the insertion point is at the uh, lesser trochanter of the femur. So uh, whenever you injure the psoas, you always have problem. The patient always has problem in flexion of the hip, and uh, by doing O lift, you don't damage the psoas. Therefore, the uh, the pain during uh, pain during the flexion and difficulty during the flexion. Uh, post operatively will be really less and these are the structures which you have to be really really careful while dissecting the peritoneum or retracting the peritoneum uh, sorry uh, so as muscle
So uh, these are the neural structure, iliohypogastric, ilioinguinal, genetofemoral nerve, lateral cutaneous uh, nerve, thigh femoral, and the flatter nerve. These nerves will fall anteriorly when you go downwards from L1 to L5. Therefore, doing only at the lower level will be slightly difficult. So uh, the image on the right side shows the neural structures which is coming anteriorly when it comes to the level of L5. Therefore, it is always safe to do OLIP at the proximal levels. And at the max, L4, L5 can be done. And below L4, L5, even if, if, you, if you have an access, first of all, you don't have an access because of the EDF. Even if you have an access, it will be really risky to do the uh, interbody fusion at that level. So the best level to do interbody fusion with OLIP is L3 and L4. Yeah, Ram. This is right. Hello. Ram. Sorry, my slides are stuck. So I'm getting into it. Ram, you are not audible. Yeah. Am I audible now? Yuraj, can you hear me? I can hear you, Ram. Uh, can you hear you, Ram? Am I audible now? Uh, yes, Ram, you are audible. Uh, yes, yeah, Ram, yeah. you are audible. So, uh, this image shows the oblique uh, window, which is a uh, access for your olive. So, which is the uh, exact distance between the iota and the equilateral so as not to describe. This is the working channel for olive. So, this is a uh, whole uh, window in the cadaveric uh, diagram. So that is between the greater vessel and the psoas muscle. So the whole window is maximum and very safe at the proximal level. That is from L2, 3 and L3, 4. When you come down, uh, the whole window will be very less and you have uh, good chances of injuring the uh, neural structures. So, uh, in all, if you always need pre-op axial MRI to see the oval window, if the oval window is not good enough or very narrow, it's always better to do the LF instead of OLIP. So, you don't usually need the uh, neuromonitoring when you do the OLIP, whereas in, while doing LF, you always need a neuromonitoring whether to see if you are injuring the neural structure while dissecting the psoas. So uh, the patient position as we have discussed, we don't need a, a table breakup and the incision will be five centimeter anterior to the uh, incision where you take for the lip. And the psoas is not split, it is retracted posteriorly. And uh, for doing the fusion, you'll have to do the orthogonal uh, manual, which I'll be explaining in the later slides. And this is a neuromonitoring when you do a lip. So once you reach the disk space, you put your guide wire, identify the level in this space. You take both AP and the lateral view to see exactly where you're landing your refractor. So once you put your guide wire, you put a serial dilators through your guide wire. Once you put your serial dilators to your guide wire, then dock your retractor and fix it to the frame. So this is an image after you dock the retractor. You'll have to confirm your position of the retractor even after you dock the retractor so that you don't have any problem while doing the procedure. I think there are a lot of issues today.
I, I think now it's better. Echo, I am not hearing any echo right now. Okay. Okay. I think echo is because of Dr. Ram Krishna. Correct? Correct. Correct. <laughs> okay, let me finish then. Are we back? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Hello? Um, yes, good. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry for the interruption. So, uh, this is how I uh, do the serial dilation. So, once I do the serial dilation, I'll drop the retractor. And uh, in ellipse, uh, on the lateral left side, if you can see, it is 90 degrees. And in all, if it is uh, oblique, through the oval window. Once you dock the retractor properly and confirm on this PM, then you can remove the dilators. Uh, so uh, while uh, doing the expansion uh, of the dilat uh, retractors, the segmental vessels, which is at the center of the body, this is the segmental vessel. Uh, the center one, you can see the uh, discs. Space and uh, the segmental vessel which is shown uh, is at the center of the body. Uh, so you, uh, you have to be always careful while dilating the retractor. So it has to be parallel to the disc space to uh, aid in orthogonal maneuver. So once you enter, uh, reach the disc space, you have to do the uh, disc space, then uh, do the preparation. And uh, this is a small video which shows uh, how we do the discectomy and do the end plate preparation. So, you get a very good approach and access to the disk space. Uh, you go uh, doing the discectomy through and through of the annulus. So, you have to remove on both the sides. So once you remove, so once you are done with the plate preparation, you take a trial entry, and before doing the trial, you have you need to always size your cage preoperatively, either in the MRI or the CT. So once the size. Uh, is measured preoperatively. Intraoperatively, also you'll have to size with the appropriate uh, disc sizes. And once you confirm with the trial, then you take a appropriate disc size uh, cage filled with the bony graph. Usually, we take the EAC test as autograph and then introduced the cage into the level of interest. So, when you introduce, the angle is oblique. If you introduce in the same way, you will be going posterior into the canal. Therefore, orthogonal maneuver is uh, important where once you are start, uh, uh, entering the disc space, 
you go as positively as possible in this way and which will be 90 degrees and then start introducing the cage in the this place and you'll have to take both ap and lateral views to see the position of the cage in ap view it has to be symmetrical exactly those are the marking line which gives the feedback to you and the cage has to be placed anterior to the instantaneous axis of rotation so that there is a good compressive forces following the wolf's law which aids in the good conic fusion so the advantages are with the minimal approach with a very minimal blood loss will will get a better disc clearance and intact preparation with a la with a chance to put a larger cage and we can restore the good disc height thereby indirect decompression can be possible either foraminal or canal to a certain extent and it is easier when you do a revision surgeries you prevent the scarring of the neural structures as well by doing this the disadvantages are it is technically demanding and you need to do a lot of cadaveric uh, uh, forces before doing it individually or you take assistance from a surgeon who has already done it and the injury to the psoas muscle injuring the vascular structures and the neural structures nearby and the ureter injury can be possible if you don't land up at the exact oval window so uh, you have to know your anatomy properly before doing this procedure uh, our mentor used to say know your anatomy properly Uh, if you know your anatomy properly your surgery follows so as your anatomy is your surgery thank you low yeah yeah oh is it Ram, I will mute you because the echo is coming from your side actually. And uh, yeah, uh, any questions? Any? Uh, yes, uh, so we we'll go to the next uh, talk, and after that we'll come back to this uh, questions for Pranithi. Uh, Yuvraj. Yes, Ram. Uh, yes, Ram. Shall I start? Fine. Okay, so I'll just start off. Uh, so the, I'm going to be talking on uh, navigation in spine surgery. So just an extension of uh, how we do minimally invasive spine surgeries. The outline of my talk is going to be why we need navigation. Then I'll be dealing with the concept of navigation and how the OR workflow has to be met. Uh, then the patient outcomes as per literature, and I'll just touch upon robotics in spine surgery at the end. So why really do we need navigation? So why in spine surgery do we need navigation? Is the first question. So I think we all agree that spine surgery needs meticulous and steady hand work, and we use small corridors for surgery, and we need to keep collateral tissue damage at a minimum, and uh, most of our procedures are long, and the surgeon is prone to fatigue. So spine surgery is an ideal candidate for using technology assistance for optimal outcomes. And so MAS is one such thing. So uh, we all agree that MAS has less muscle damage and reduced blood loss, and reduced post-op pain, improved outcomes, etc., etc. Uh, so all of that is beneficial for the patient. But for the surgeon, the problem in doing an MAS is this one: that is more radiation exposure. And it is studied that a spine surgeon, compared to a hip surgeon, sees up to 50 times more of radiation dose in his lifetime. So. 
problem of radiation is something that we want to address using navigation. So according to Oxford Dictionary, navigation is the process or activity of accurately ascertaining one's position and planning and following the route. So this is done using computer assistance in surgeries here. And how does navigation benefit the patient? That's the first question. So it is said that it, it provides improved accuracy in predictive group insertion. So in a study, it's found that CT-based navigation has an accuracy of close to 91%, whereas X-ray gated has an accuracy of close to 85%. And uh, incidence of screw, uh, predictive screw breach was about 6% in navigation and 15% in combination insertion. So this patient stands to benefit by improved accuracy. How does the surgeon benefit? The surgeon stands to benefit by reduced radius exposure. So it's probably beneficial to both the patient and the surgeon, and it's probably something worth looking at. But what are the problems or what are the barriers in starting to use navigation? So the problem is the entire operating team needs to be trained in how the machine works and how it has to be integrated into their daily workflow in uh, instruments, etc. Cetera, et cetera. And uh, we need updated imaging equipment for that. So in our conventional CMs and all that is not going to work. We need better CMs, better imaging equipments, and cost. So that's the most important thing we need to worry about. So how to understand navigation. So the concept of navigation can be understood simply by thinking of or looking at Google Maps. So how does Google Maps work? So let's say you are standing somewhere on the road. You have a phone. Your phone is your GPS transmitter or receiver. And your phone is located or localized by multiple satellites. So set that three satellites triangulate your position. And the position is ascertained in uh, latitude longitude based on the satellites, uh, what they get. And this particular latitude longitude that you're standing at is superimposed on a pre-built map of the Earth, planet Earth. And that gives you where exactly you're standing and where exactly you need to go next. So this is sort of how navigation also works. So in navigation, the satellite is replaced by a receiver camera. So this disease, an ultra, uh, this disease infrared radiation. It transmits and reflects infrared radiation back from the patient. And the GPS transmitter is replaced by a navigation probe. So this is a probe that can be placed on the patient, on the patient's skin, and it has these uh, reflectors. So these reflectors will communicate with the infrared camera of the monitor. And the map is built by using image uh, software, querying software and reference points. So we need two things. First is you need a patient's image, anatomical image, that is a CT or an X-ray. Second thing is you need a reference for the image. So we just uh, you need both the map and the longitude longitude. So the map can be got by the and the latitude of can be got by this reference probe. I'll just uh, explain a little more about this as we do. So what are the imaging systems that we have in market? So we have OA, and uh, that's uh, sort of a four-arm CT. Then we have IRO, that is an intro-op CT, and then we have Z, uh, that's a 3D fluoroscope. So I'm just limiting my discussion to just uh, four or three systems. It's not, this one exclusive this. We have many more imaging systems also. So what is OAM? OAM is... Uh, as an open arm here, and this open arm can be placed around the patient and the gantry can be closed as a patient is pushed and we get into operative CT images using that. Uh, so yeah, so approximately it costs uh, four crores, I believe. So these um, cost details are taken from uh, abroad and they just uh, done a cost or a dollar conversion to rupees. I'm not sure how much it exactly cost in India. And IRO is an intro CT. So what IRO does is IRO has an attached table, which can be filtered or rotated as wish. And uh, this also an intro CT. It costs about 5.5 crores. Z vision R. This is a 3D fluoroscope. So on just on appearance, it looks like the regular CM, but it is, what it can does is it can obliquely rotate uh, as per program, and it can obtain 3D fluoroscope images, and it can give you almost a 3D intro CT picture. So this costs somewhere about two crores in the So what's the difference or uh, when do you have to use a 3D fluoroscope versus an intro CT? 3D fluoroscope is something that you showed last time, so Z in 3D image. So 3D fluoroscopes are used when you need more speed, more efficiency, and uh, when it's want to be easily moved around. And we also need to keep in mind that 3D fluoro, though it appears like a CR, it can do radiation doses as high as a CT. So this is something that the OR team should be wary of. So they should not think that it's just a CM so they can walk around without protection inside. And intro CT, so that is a uh, complete uh, closed gantry. So that is better for patients who have high body mass index or in cervical regions where imaging can be difficult and also for long-term 
So one, one hand is the imaging technique, another hand is the instrumentation of the software that we have. So an examples of these are one from Medtronic and this is station. And there's, then there's a seven day surgical system and then there's something called spine mask navigation from Striker. So this is an example from Medtronic. So as you can see, there's a separate monitor here and a separate camera receiver transmitter here. This is something from 70 surgery, the both the receiver transmitter and light and monitor are all in the same uh, machine. Striker also has the camera and the monitor in the same machine. So how does it work? So how, how do you go about doing it? So this is an example of how the OR has to be set up for doing navigation. So the anesthesia workstation is over here. This is where your camera monitor is going to be placed. That is position one. This is the head end of the table, foot end of the table, surgeon, surgeon. So this is the primary surgeon going to be standing here. And this is where you place your imaging system, either the OM or the 3D photoscope. The OR nurse stands there, so the circulating nurse stands here. If needed, you can also use this foot end position. In some cases, you may have to do have a foot end position instead of a head end position. So this is how the OR is set up. So this is just a picture. So this is the camera. At the end of the patient, foot of the patient, the 3D photoscope is placed here, and the surgeon stands on either side, and the floor the staff nurse stands on this side. What needs to be noted is the camera and the patient, there should be a clear line of sight. So the camera is there, patient is there. You should not have anybody standing in between these two. So a clear line of sight of the camera is very, very important for the camera to uh, look at the probes and to detect the probes and to give you a clear picture of what's happening inside. So what are the steps? So once you position the patient, so the camera is there, that's your satellite, and then you need to get a map of the patient. So that's the next step. So to get the map, you need a, a reference point and then the uh, 3D or the CT image. So the reference point is, can either be placed on a bone, but it's an invasive method. So in this example, there's a pin placed on the posterior relaxed spine, and there's a reference uh, frame that's attached to this. So you see the, all these multiple bulbs, these are nothing but infrared reflector uh, bulbs. So that's an invasive method of having a reference frame. Other example is a non-invasive method in which a reference frame like this, this is from strike that's called spine mask. So this is just stuck onto the patient's skin and uh, here is your uh, reference frame bar transmitter. So now the patient's reference frame is in place, the satellite is in place, you need to get the patient's anatomical data. So that is done using either the OM or the 3D fluoroscope. So this is can be completely automated. So when the machine has to be brought to the patient and we need to make sure there's adequate space for the machine to rotate 360 degrees and to get your image. And uh, you can just start the process and everybody can leave the theater except for probably one person in a t-shirt to monitor the patient's vitals. So a radiation exposure can be kept to almost nil. The surgeon, the OR team, everybody can leave the theater while data acoustic is going on. This probably takes about five minutes. And once uh, the system has uh, got the CT of the patient, it will uh, calibrate this with the reference frame of the patient and it will create a map that is there. So what happens next is you just have to take, uh, you either can enter the theater, you start the surgery, you take another probe which has these reflectors, you place it anywhere on the patient's skin. So this will give you an idea of where, which part of the body you are at. So for example, if you place it near the L4 vertebra, it will, the screen will show you that you are which part of the L4 vertebra you are at. So that's where it works. So for example, yeah. So this is a reference frame there. The monitor is placed uh, at the other end here. And uh, once you know where you are at, you can start your screen incision. You can start putting your uh, KYs and your taps using this. So this is a tap that is being used. You can see that even the tap has a, a reference monitor. So these two, give you an idea of where exactly in the patient or where exactly in the patient's map you are at, which the computer will uh, provide a reference for. So as you're tapping, let's say the L4 vertebra or the L5 vertebra, so you know where exactly medial lateral trajectory is, what your superior trajectory is, how medial you're going. So all three views are seen and you get a perfect idea of how long screw you have to put and how deep you have to go inside. So while, so important thing to remember is while all of this is happening, there is no radiation exposure going on because the map has already been built. So what are you doing right now? There is no CT or X-ray that is act actively running right as these processes are going on. So if you just want to do a decompression, if you don't want to do any implantation, so this is how it is done. So based on the reference probe, you know whether you are at L4-5 implantment space or L5 implantment space that can be located. 
take a skin incision and dock your uh, tubes there and then go ahead and do your surgery. So even if you dock your tube, you can use a reference monitor to know exactly which is in the spine you are at. An example of uh, how an L5S1 or an L5S1 TLIF can be done. So again, you see that the monitor is there, the camera is there, the surgeons are looking at it and uh, there is the instrument, it's probably a jump shading needle. So that has a reference probe on it. And uh, this pair so this by using a spine mask there. So you see, this can be done. So using this, you know which pedicle you're at and you can tap and can get the pedicle. And once you're done getting the, can get the pedicles, then you can uh, dock a tube at the LPS in this space. Again, using navigation. And after that, the interbody preparation, all that goes on using the regular operating methods. So if, so for if, for example, you see the surgeon has to look at this monitor at all times, so that's probably something that is inconvenient. So they have come up with this augmented exhibition in which you have a head display, like what you get on uh, BMW or Mercedes car. So you don't, you don't have to look up at the screen. So there's a, a small uh, head, head uh, mounted unit, so that will give you a head display right in on the patient's view. So you don't have to look up or do anything, you can concentrate just on the surgical field as we do the surgery. So that's how the thing works. So as you can see, you can use this for decompressions, for instrumentation, and also for interbody fusions. So what does literature say about this? How does this compare to a uh, regular free amp technique? So one study in 2000 said that there's a 15.3% error rate in free amp technique compared to 5.4% error rate in navigation screws. And uh, of the free amp technique, four patients had uh, neurological complications. Okay. Another meta-analysis in 2010 uh, they found that higher accuracy of uh, you know, navigated, uh, navigation such as screws and uh, neurological injury was supposedly less with navigation, but it was not statistically significant. So, that is something that we have to keep in mind. A 2012 meta analysis found that, so this is what I quoted right at the start of my talk. So, there's 6% critical pieces in navigation, 15% in free and techniques, and three neurological complications in free and group. But whether this contributed to any Division surgeries, uh, it was found that there is no statistically significant difference between the reoperation rates because of these perceived critical features or other complications. Uh, another meta analysis in 2012, again, they found even though um, the accuracy rate in uh, navigated screws are right, there was no difference in screw revision or reoperation of the injuries between navigation and regular close for the screw groups. So, so these are all just uh, any pedicle screw techniques. So, uh, coming to thoracic uh, or the adolescent diabetic scoliosis surgeries, it's found that revision rates just because so this is a study of displaced screws in adolescent diabetic scoliosis, and uh, they found that revision rates because of poorly uh, inserted screws are about 0.6 percent, and symptomatic displaced screws that is neurological deficits etc. are just 0.14 percent of almost 6,000 screws. So this is something that goes on to say that even though your pedicle screw is not perfectly inside, it may not have any clinical relevance. So somebody has done this surgery, uh, a study in scoliosis surgery, you know, navigation versus free hand screws, and they found that uh, navigated group had increased radiation for the patients, but there's no benefits other than that. So the title of the study itself is telling you everything. So they found that even though navigation was used, it did not confer any uh, added benefit for the patient, except for increasing radiation doses to the patient. And so this is something that's interesting that I come across. Uh, somebody has studied uh, navigation in teaching of trainees. So they found that uh, safe teaching of trainees can be done when navigation assisted systems are in place because the loss of control or uh, rate of leeches are much less than that. And uh, so what the, the training gets easier judgment of how to candidate a critical track mode insert the and this learning can be transferred to free and technique. So this is what they found. So almost looks like uh, even though the pedicle screws insertion is more accurate, but it doesn't look like there's any clinical relevance to it as far as uh, current data suggests. So what do we take away from this? Or this navigation help? Does it help the patient? Probably because it gives higher accuracy in screw insertion, but the clinical significance of this is not been established. So even though pedicles was maybe 100% paka inside this group, pedicles, whether that translates to better clinical outcomes, we're really not sure. For the surgeon, the learning curve is steep, but uh, reduced radiation exposure is something that is really something that the surgeon should look at. 
So surgeon has definitely something positive to take away from radiation because you can be you can do a MI surgery with much less radiations. For the hospital, uh, probably high cost of entry, getting these ins uh, instruments, getting all this other going to take a lot of cost initially, but probably that can mean that the hospital can build the patient's floor, that's something that the hospital can look at. So that is the state of navigation surgery right now. Even though there is higher accuracy of instrumentation, higher accuracy of decompression, the clinical significance of this or clinical relevance of this is really something we are not sure about. I'll just move on to robotics uh, in spine surgery. I'll just, just uh, touch upon what it is and uh, what is the role of it in today's uh, surgical practice. So robotic surgery is something similar to navigation surgery. It has the same principles. It, it uses computer assisted navigation also. But what better it does is it eliminates the surgeon's uh, interference with the tracking systems. So like I told you, the tracking systems in uh, 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 navigated surgeries, I told you the monitor camera has to have a clear vision of the field, which should not disturb the uh, reference frames, etc., etc. So all of this uh, can be minimized using a robot. So the surgeon's role comes down to much less. And uh, the robot cannot be fatigued. Okay, you can do multiple surgeries one after the other and the results can be reproduced with the robot much uh, no, less than compared to a human. And uh, currently, the robotic surgery is limited only to pedicles replacement. So we are not, uh, robots are not doing anything other than this currently, no role for decompression, et cetera, et cetera. So this is the most commonly uh, studied or extensively clinically used robot that's called a major robot uh, or a spine assist robot, uh, approximately cost of about 3.3 kilos. So this is how it is, looks like, right? So it is mounted on the patient and using three bony uh, anchors. So two at either PSIS and one at one spinous process. So obviously these are thicker pins and this is going to be a thinner wire and a rail is mounted on this and the robo moves on this up and down and it tells you where to do your surgery. So let's see actual setup. How does it work? So we do a pre-op CT scan and create a virtual spinal map for the robo software. So CT scan can be done even before the uh, patient comes into the OR. So that's an advantage. And the surgeon can do a template even before the surgery starts anytime. So you can uh, actually feed the, tell the computer that you want to insert screws at L4 bilateral, L5 bilateral. You can do the computer to the trajectory, the size of screw that you want to use, etc. And the virtual template is already ready even before the patient comes into the theater. So once the patient is in the theater, use intro probes that are mounted on the robot. So like the reference probe that we use in regular navigation. So the robo uses this along with intraoperative X-rays. And uh, all of this data is compiled by the software and the software gives the robot a virtual map on which it can work. So let's say now the virtual map is ready. The robo will move on this ray. So let's say it will just move near the L4 and this outer arm of the robo will tilt and it will give you the exact trajectory to the L4 pedicle. So once that is given, now it's the surgeon has to come in now. The surgeon has to drop a K wire down this trajectory that the robo has given you already. So that's the only thing that this robo can do. This robo can let, uh, help you in dropping a K wire or can help you uh, cannulate the pedicle initially. So after that, the robo arm has to be moved away and uh, tapping and screw insertion can be done by a regular MIS instrumentation. That's sort of how it looks like. So the arm gives you the trajectory. On top of it, the surgeon goes in. He follows the same trajectory and he places the K-wire inside. And then a tapping and screw is done. So I think this, I believe this uh, robot that applauds to Chennai has, uh, this is not something I've taken from their website. This is probably the one that they have is a robot. Even though this robo uh, was studied and it was found to have good uh, accuracy in some studies, there was one particular study that came out in 2012 and uh, that said that the uh, accuracy of these robotic screws are lesser compared to fluoroscopic screws, 85% versus 90%. And they said that 10 out of 146 robo screws required intraoperative removal and reinsertion. So the reason that these authors felt was probably the anchoring K wire, that this wire that is used on the process, probably tended to come loose sometime in the middle of the procedure, thereby throwing the entire uh, uh, spine virtual map out of balance. And sometimes they found that the drill tended to skid off the facets in uh, arthritis facets, etc. So that's uh, where things stand. So to improve the anchoring of the uh, robo, so there are some other uh, things that are coming up. One is a Rosa robo. 
So instead of anchoring the robot onto the patient, this robot is uh, it's, it's floor mounted. It's like a microscope. Uh, so this is actually initially it was meant for uh, cranial surgeries or brain surgery. So this is being now tweaked or modified for spinal applications. So what it also does a similar uh, thing. So it gives you where exactly you have to start on the patient. So it will give you the starting point for a screw, say the L4 screw. And it's a surgeon now who has to candidate the L4 pedicle and he has to uh, tap and insert the screw. That's what the Rosa robot does. What we have uh, now, the latest entry is uh, from Globus, it's Excelsius. I think it costs about 700 half flows. So the difference of Excelsius compared to the Rosa robot is Excelsius will let you even insert the screw through the Robo arm. It has instrumentation that will support even screw insertion to the robo arm. So even K wire insertion, tap screw, all of them can be done using the robo arm. So thereby it gives you a better control. So all of these are only for pedicle screw applic insertion. Other potential applications for robot in spine surgery is uh, uh, laminectomy has been attempted in a uh, big model, but it's been done using open approach, not MIS approach. Sometimes you can even combine uh, MIS key lift. You can uh, insert the screws using the robo, and you can even use the robo to identify the location of the preset so that you can do a uh, screen insertion and uh, start doing your PLI through the preset. You can even use the robo to uh, decorticate the preset. So you can localize the preset, you can open the preset up. Instead of using uh, uh, cutting burrs and all that, you can, uh, sorry, instead of uh, cutting the preset off, you can use a burr to decorticate the preset and uh, place the craft there. So, uh, anterior spinal surgery has been done using the Da Vinci robot. There's just one case in literature. They have done an uh, L5 S1 ALIF using Da Vinci robot. So, it's only one instance of anterior spinal surgery using this. So, Da Vinci robot probably is the most famous robot out there. It's used for laparoscopic surgeries. Uh, but uh, till now, it's not been uh, adapted for posterior spinal surgery. So, whatever robots we have in spinal surgery, they are just guidance for the surgeon. The surgeon needs to come in and he has to do the procedure himself. Uh, much unlike a Davis robot, in which the surgeon can sit away from the OR and he can do everything through a remote operating chamber. So, those are my references for this talk. So, that's uh, a picture from a a short stay at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York. So that's where I learned uh, the principles of navigation surgery. That was Dr. Qureshi. So that's exclusive navigation surgery. We use navigation for uh, health patient this type of I'm done. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Uraj. Uh, thank you. So, the purpose of adding this uh, talk is that so in future, the present scenario, the surgeons cannot be replaced by any of these uh, navigation. And I hope in future, uh, there might be chances that comes like work from home. So the surgeon has to work from home and the, your robots will start working. And uh, navigation's uh, current scenario is not that uh, affordable, but uh, still the advantages are much better because I'm been using it for the last two years. Uh, we use Medtronic Stealth Station and particularly I find it useful mainly with MIS surgeries. And, uh, with respect to OLIF and with respect to uh, navigator spine surgery, if there are any questions, questions. we'll take a few questions. Ram Krishna. Yes, Ram. So, uh, one uh, question is, uh, there has been a lot of uh, olives now coming up for alpha as soon as well. Yeah. Do you have any experience about that? No, alpha S1 I don't prefer to do. As I said, the neural elements will tend to come anteriorly as you go down. So uh, I don't want to take much risk doing L5 S1. Personally, I've not done any L5 S1 uh, olives. I would rather suggest going uh, anterior ALF uh, to do the L5 S1 because uh, the major vessel will be already bisected above it. It will be easier for you to do ALF at L5 S1 than OLIF. Take home message regarding Olif. Sorry? To start with, because olive surgeries are not commonly 
uh, yes, yes. at least in these people who have as participants now so yeah fish to start with usually uh, all if you do in a long uh, def- uh, especially degenerative scoli patients uh, where the disc spaces you have uh, you see a vacuum phenomenon it's it's the best to do in such cases uh, to do a lesser number of levels to get a good lordosis uh, which improves the uh, post operative outcome of the patient both in uh, uh, morbidity as well as the postural uh, this thing we can achieve good lumbar lordosis which is equal to the uh, pelvic incidence by doing it since you are putting a wider bigger cage you get you can restore the disc space as as much as possible so as to increase the lordosis and you have uh, angulated cages as well uh, by putting that you will achieve much lordosis so uh, in such cases better to do olif and do a percutaneous fixation posteriorly the outcome will be much better and uh, by doing olif uh, uh, you get a lot of area for bony fusion as you said yes olif are not uh, done by most of the surgeons because even the cages uh, we don't get as easily so uh, now metronix uh, is giving us a good cage uh, for the olif but uh, to be frank uh, even i would uh, uh, do posterior surgeries on a frequent basis because even your assistant has to be trained who is assisting you even the staff has to be trained if you are doing such surgeries so probably if you keep on doing the large number of cases uh, the usage of the cage will increase and the number of surgeons if they start doing uh, olives more uh, the instruments will also be cheaper because the cage itself is very expensive if you see the t lift cage for the metronics it will be somewhere around 25 to 30000 and uh, olive cage would be 80000 if i'm not wrong so uh, the cages are also very expensive once the surgeon starts using the production is more probably cost would come down start with i would recommend few things uh, for surgeons to do olive first thing which i would i how i learned is first go to some cadaveric uh, uh, pictures yes so yeah. works and so learn from that and uh, with the seniors with the help of seniors initially but uh, over a long run when you follow these steps this you get done in an academic then with the help of a seniors uh, olive will be really a easy thing and uh, the problem which we face usually is because it, it is now like you do a positive procedure one shot no change in positions but okay you do olive you change back to positive procedure so it takes time yeah. and uh, the only uh, few indications which i feel is uh, significant scoliosis where uh, you can reduce the number of levels of fusion by doing an anterior procedure that's a one advantage is a kind with uh, rolling otherwise yes. uh, the post and uh, i the next advantage which they say is indirect decompression which uh, as a surgeon i always feel if i will be happy in decompressing and then seeing the roots which happy yeah, but still it works in certain cases like light releases or this reduced disc space to do anterior uh, jacking up of the disc that helps uh, and that works in an indirect decompression yes absolutely as i said uh, for severe stenosis even i don't prefer to do uh, it thinking it would decompress uh, as a indirect measure so uh, for uh, as i said to for the four sc- degenerative scoliosis conditions where there is no significant canal stenosis i would prefer doing the olive passage uh, for significant canal stenosis it's always better to thoroughly decompress posteriorly when the patient complains more uh, of a claudication pain or the radicular pain than uh, the back pain so if the patient has more of a back pain and less of a claudication or a radicular pain probably this uh, would be a better option but if it's the other way around as you said just always decompressing the nerve roots is a better option and uh, to start off with as you said yes always go to the cadaveric lab 
learn thoroughly see the anatomical structures all the uh, images uh, and the videos which i have taken are from the cadaveric uh, video uh, as uh, in the uh, patient we don't see this much of exposure so uh, always go to a cadaveric lab appreciate the muscles feel it uh, once you are thorough with it go to two or three cadaveric sessions then start doing with a senior when you are doing it alone two three cases when you start doing it alone take the help of uh, the access surgeon i uh, initial cases i have took the help of uh, uh, the urologist to give me the access and uh, gradually uh, the size of the incision has come down and i've started using the uh, minimal approach where i know exactly which muscle feels like what so uh, then i can uh, get a proper docking uh, of the instrumentation as uh, the docking and the positioning of your retractor is very important uh to do the surgery because uh, if you don't have the proper docking you might injure the neural structures and throughout the position you will be having problem in positioning your uh, retractor so each and every step uh, at every stage is important by uh, while doing this procedure so it has an advantage at the same time it has a disadvantage also therefore you you need to uh, practice uh, a lot before doing such procedures individually to navigation kapil viraj has given a very nice example of uh, google maps so and that was i think it would have been a really useful to most of our participants thanks for that excellent example so any uh, thank you take home no. message yeah any take home message with respect to navigation now no, sir, i think i said that in my talk only so navigation is something that is like a new toy on the block and people who like using it are using it uh, for almost all cases uh, but does it really add any value to the patient we don't know but i think it definitely adds value to the surgeon is in terms of reducing radiation uh, during the surgery so yeah cost is the barrier probably as things move on probably the cost comes down i think it has a potential to become a norm we call it the cost so Thanks, uh, Ram, and thanks, Yuraj, for uh, sharing it. So, yeah. hopefully, this might be the last uh, webinar as well. Let's see if we could catch up in future because uh, this lockdown is also getting finished, and I think people might start busy with their works. So, I'll keep you yeah. posted in the WhatsApp. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye.